and after, after the third series, there are still some gaps there for you. Okay. Um, I'm on the Holyoke School Committee. I represent Ward 2. Ward 2 um, consists of South Holyoke, some of Springdale, and Churchill. I was elected eight years ago. When I ran um, I and was elected, I became the first Puerto Rican woman elected to public office in the state of Massachusetts. And one, <laughs> and one would think that Holyoke, um, as some folks think, is so backward and that we're behind the time, but Holyoke made history. We were able to elect a Puerto Rican woman into public office, so we're not that behind because Springfield still hasn't done it, and it took um, the eastern part of the state a very long time to do it. So we're not as backward as some people may think we are. I have, um, after eight long years and a lot of battle scars um, and a lot of good and bad experiences, I announced at the beginning of this year that I would not be seeking re-election. My younger sister died of cancer in December, and she left me a two-year-old and a four-year-old um, to raise. So I'm quitting the school committee. But what was really wonderful is, is that someone from this neighborhood, from South Folio, made the decision, made the commitment, and is willing to make the sacrifices to run for school committee. A lot of you know her, Ruth Cruz. She. Yeah. She left. Ruth has left us for a moment. Oh. Um, she might be joining us in a little while so that you could get to know her. She is running unopposed. Elections are November the 2nd. No one's running against her, so we know who's going to win the election. So it would be wonderful for you to get to know who the school committee member is for this ward if you live here. Um, it was my intention to run for state office. Um, that is on hold, but I think that there are a lot of wonderful people in this city um, that will be able not only to run for local um, positions such as school committee and city council, but I see um, in the near future a Latino running for the mayor of the city. I see Latinos having the potential of running for the senator and state representative seats as well. And I don't think that is too far behind. So um, I only encourage for you to participate and for you to stay active um, in the elections for those of you that vote tonight. Um, it is my intention to share with you today for this workshop, how is it that city government works? It is not 100% correct. It is my interpretation, it is my understanding, and I will be sharing you what my experiences have been. I have been able to gather some information. I was only able to make 20 packets. I ask that the students that come from, I should say the participants, that come from TRP and Youth Action share. Your um, coordinators and directors have offered to make copies for the rest of you um, at a very near future. Um, and for, if there isn't enough for everyone, I just say to give us your name and address and I'll be happy to mail them out to you. So, with the, oh, the name, let me start handing them out. that is within City Hall and in the school department. And for a review of the information, I've been able to get you a listing of all city officials, whether they're elected or appointed, um, or, well, as we go along, I'll talk about appointments and how the hiring process is in City Hall. Um, next will be a list of all of the commissions as to whether or not they're paid. I took notice that there is one commission that is not listed here, and it's the Park and Recreation 
Commission. Um, although they are listed in the city officials list, it is not on the list um, as to whether or not they get paid. So I'll get that information for you for at a later date. The next list is the city council, um, who the members are and their committees. Um, what are the standing committees for city council? The next largest packet is our city charter. These are the ordinances and the rules that govern our city that are made up by the city council and our legislators. And the next packet has to do with um, the Holyoke Public Schools. Um, who the uh, who's, excuse me? What are the subcommittees and the members of the of the subcommittees? And what the task, what the mission is of the um, of the committees, and I'll review that with you, as well as the bylaws of the Holyoke School Committee as it is today. That's what's in the packet. It's a lot of information. As I was trying to prepare for today, I had gathered my own packet, and I thought about well, we'll review this. But in fact, if we review every single section of it, every single piece of it, we'll never get out of here. So a lot of it you'll have to take with you and read through it and make reference to it from time to time as um, your needs come up and questions and ideas. The chief administrator of the city is the mayor. The mayor is elected every two years by the citizens of Holyoke. The mayor is the one that basically makes final decisions regarding budgets, regarding um, business that takes place in the city that does not need city council approval or that in fact the mayor is the one that has the final decision. as another governing body, the city council. We also have the school committee that are also elected. And through the mayor's authority, he has the right to um, hire and appoint department heads, and sometimes it, goes, it has to first go through city council. <coughs> and he also has the right to appoint commissions and boards, it could be the board of directors of something, um, from time to time. Again, there for some commissions and some departments, he has to submit that to the city council, and for others, he does not. Welcome, Nuevo Puente. That's fine, welcome. It is not my intention today to go into a lot of information and discussion regarding elections. We are going to do that at our next um, workshop, which will be on October 27th. Um, but for the purpose of this meeting today, the mayor is elected every two years, as is the entire city council. The school committee, for their reward representation, are elected every two years, but there is at large, there are two at large seats that are elected every four years. Every four years, one of the at large school committee members gets either, but has to run for re election. Um, so this year, there is one seat that is up for re election. Um, she is running unopposed. She will be elected for four years. And then in two years, the gentleman that is in, um, in place now, he will have to run for re-election for another four years. So there's always someone on the school committee. Um, if everyone was to be re was not to be re-elected and there was to be an entire new body, there would be at least one senior member that would not be up for re-election. And that was for continuity purposes that legislation was written that way. The city of Holyoke has seven wards. They're divided up um, in geographic areas. They are not all proportionately 
um, separate. Sometimes you're in a ward and you cross the street and you're in a different ward. For instance, you could be in Ward 1 if you're at Pat's Supermarket right down the street. If you cross the street over to Capri Pizza, you're now in Ward 2. Okay? You could be in a different ward while you're by the Dunedin School, and when you go up by the Ingleside Mall, you're in a completely different ward. So all it sometimes takes is less than a mile, sometimes just a matter of crossing the street, that you're in two different wards. There are seven wards in total in the city of Holyoke. Each ward gets a representative on the city council and on the school committee. Two different seats, two different individuals. Um, there has been a lot of discussion if you run for city council, can you also run for school committee in the same ward? And to be honest with you, I don't think that that has ever been discussed to the fullest. I still think that it cannot be done because there's conflict of interest. Um, if you're on one um, governing body versus the other one. So there are seven wards in the city that if you're living in that ward, you can run for. All you've got to do is be 18 years of age and be a registered voter. That's it. That's it. There is no other criteria. You don't need a high school diploma. You don't need a bachelor's degree. You don't need to be a teacher to be on the school committee. You don't have to have prior political experience or to be have taken political science while you were at the university. Okay? So there are a lot of um, graduates from Holyoke High School that have ran successful campaigns and we have Mayor, or should I say former Mayor Dunn, who was a Holyoke High graduate. We have Charles Warren that represents Ward 6, I believe it is, Ward 5, Ward 5, excuse me. Um, on the city council, so that we are seeing graduates of Holyoke High School, yet to see one from Dean, though hopefully that will come soon, that have finished their education and have come back and have ran for political office and are now the ones who are making decisions about how we live and what the rules and laws are, how we're governed. So take mine, students, hoping to see you on city council and school committee. So there are seven ward representatives on the city council, one from each ward. There are also eight at large. And what at large means is, is that they do not run only for where they live in their ward. They run for the entire city. So that what you're looking for now is much more <coughs> votes in order to get you elected. It is very difficult to win an at-large seat because you have to cover the entire city. My experience was that I was able to get elected because I was concentrating only in the ward that I lived in, still live in, in Ward 2. I lived in La Casse Apartments. I knew the people in the area. I had been working here for a long time. I, my kids were in the school, so my kids had friends who have parents who I was able to talk to and share experiences with. So I decided to run for Ward 2, and because there were less people, of course, in this one ward as opposed to the rest of the city, I knew that we could win it, as did Diosdado Lopez when he ran two years ago and as he's running again. So that when you run at large, you have to concentrate on the entire city. You need thousands of votes. Usually you need over 1,500 votes to win an at-large position. It only took me less than 500 votes to win here in the ward. So it's a very big difference. And we'll talk about campaigns and elections and uh, fundraising for campaigns at our next session. So for the city council, there are in total 15 representatives, eight at large and seven for each ward. The city council then, once they're elected, and like this year, there's an election on November 2nd, the first week of January, there's going to be what they call the swearing in. And both the mayor, the school committee, the city council, um, the tax collector, and the city clerk will all be sworn in. And at that, right after they get sworn in, the city council goes into session. They have their first order of business. And it's usually announced 
add to the swearing in that they're going straight into session and they have to vote for a president of the council for the last I can almost assure you six years Joseph McGivern from Ward 4 has been um, the president of the council there are five committees and it's in your packet um, who the committees, what the name of the committees are, and um, who's on them as well. So that every ward representative has the opportunity to be on one of the five committees. Each committee has a chairperson that's appointed by the president of the council. So that usually a lot of politicking goes on when this person is trying to get the votes because sometimes you have two and three people running to be president of the council. So then you get, you start talking to the 15, or should I say 14, city councilors and try to figure out who's gonna give you your, their vote. And you remember those who vote for you and then you give them the committees that they want. That's the way it works. <laughs> it took me a long time to figure that one out. Are there any questions on this? No? Does this reflect your student council at all? Is anyone on student council yet here? You're on student council. Yes. It does represent it? Yeah. Uh, the city council are uh, elected, then the, the whole student electoral president, then the subcommittees sometimes. Okay, okay. So that the committees represent your subcommittees uh -huh. of the well, student. Usually they represent the class. But they divide them the student council body, they have their own home room. Most that they discuss overall in the school, then when they go to <coughs> they go by, by classes. So we have four from the seniors, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. It's very much like it does. Um, the, the committees of the city council, the five committees, are the ordinance committee, the finance committee, the public safety committee, public service, and the redevelopment. And I must share with you that it was my intention on bringing to you today some kind of a blurb, a paragraph, an explanation of what each of the committee's task is. And the city clerk informed me that there's no such, um, should I say, um, information or um, explanation of each of the committees. So I'm not able to bring that to you today. And not being a city councilor, I feel somewhat out of place trying to define what each of these committees are. So that's why I'm only giving you this sheet of paper. It will be different for the school committee. Um, when we get to that part, I'll explain um, what I mean. So if there's no um, questions about this in terms of city council, we'll go to the school committee. School committee, very similar has seven ward representatives. Each are elected by the award. Um, the same thing, 18 years of age and a, a Holyoke resident. And um, that you're registered to vote here in the city. That's it. That's the criteria to run for a school committee seat in your ward. Different from the city council that has eight at-large seats, the school committee has only two so that there are nine total elected, but then we also have <coughs> our chairperson, who's the mayor. The mayor, who's the chief executor of the city, is the chairperson of the school committee. It is very similar to in Springfield and in other neighboring um, cities and towns that their mayor also sits on the school committee. From time to time, people on the committee have said that the mayor will come and vote at the committee meeting regarding something that will absolutely play a role in city government. And sometimes they say, oh, he's in conflict because he wants to make sure he's able to deliver there. He's going to try to get it from us, and it kind of goes back and forth. But um, we have yet to find a way of getting the mayor off of the school committee, so I think he's there to stay, um, or at least the mayor, not the individual. And um, two is it that it's not up to the school committee if you want him there or not. It took legislation at the State House to make that happen. So it would need legislation again to undo it. And I don't think that's going to happen right away. So, as, as the chairperson, what does the mayor do? The mayor's responsibility is 
um, basically to be meeting with the superintendent, to be calling meetings together. Um, he is basically to preside over meetings. Traditionally, for as long as I've been on and many, many years before that, the mayor has always relinquished his duties to the vice chairperson. And I think I forgot that here. Um, can I do? So that the mayor, as the chairperson, relinquishes his duties to the um, vice chair. And do you remember what I explained to you about the president of the city council, how they get their votes? Vice chairperson for the school committee does the exact same thing. We have our first meeting um, of the school committee. It's usually the first Monday, um, of right after people get sworn in. And there's a lot of politicking that goes on between election day and the swearing in and who's going to give who the vote. And depending on who gives who the vote is depends on which subcommittee you get. Now, if you don't, if you haven't voted for the vice chairperson, you're probably not going to get the committees you want, um, or at least not all of them. But that's, that's what goes on. So that's how you, please. The vice chair is elected? By, by the school committee members, just like the city council. City council gets elected, the president of the city council gets elected as president by the other city councilors. The vice chairperson for the school committee gets elected by the rest of the school committee members. Clear? Questions? <laughs> Has anyone individual held it for a long period of time? Or is it just a lot? I think that the individual that held it the longest, at least while I was on, was Mr. James Newton. Um, after um, Mr. Newton um, decided not to seek re-election, um, Mr. David Martins held it for two years, and after um, he decided not to run, I think that's a tradition, um, after he <laughs> held it for two years, um, Bonnie DiNapoli has held it for two years, and I can almost guarantee you there will be a, uh, that she will be opposed for that vice chairmanship this coming year. School committee um, basically has the, the, the vice chair running its meetings, um, designing the subcommittees. Um, this year she chose to redesign the subcommittees. And maybe that's how come I'm able to present to you today a list of the subcommittees and also what their responsibilities are. Because there was that redefinition of um, what the subcommittees were going to be. Maybe that will happen to city council at some point. In terms of the operations of how the Holyoke Public Schools operates, which I am much more familiar with, I must confess to you, than the city council, um, is that the school committee is responsible for hiring the superintendent, managing the budget, and making up the rules and policies to govern the entire um, uh, system. Those are the three responsibilities as of July the 1st with the new educational reform bill. That's it. Three to, excuse me, the one, did I say hiring? Hiring superintendent, fiscal management, and uh, developing rules and policy. We give all that information to the superintendent, and it is like him, her, to then carry it out in whichever way that they deem fit. They then have their administrators under them, they have the department heads and principals. And at some point we could get more into how different the schools will be operating this year because of educational reform. Who set up the department heads? The department heads, as of July the 1st, will be the superintendent, was the superintendent. The, the school committee, previous to, prior to July the 1st, hired everyone. Superintendent, all administrators, all teachers, custodians, cafeteria workers, you name it, we hired. Um, and we also had um, the, the authority to terminate employment. As of July the 1st, we don't do that anymore, so superintendent. There's a particular policy that we're developing that's on how the... Excuse me? I think that's the news that no. Anymore, just the there is 
policy being um, developed as we speak, or should I say tightened up, on how we want the superintendent to go through the procedure of hiring um, to make sure that it's safe and that there's no problems with it. But that still, if he hires someone today, we can tell him we don't want you to hire that person. At school committee meetings, now the superintendent um, reports to us as to who has been hired and for what position. That's it. And whether they're certified or if they're seeking a waiver. That is the only information that we get. We might get a salary attached to the name as well. Um, and that sometimes for us gives us, it's an indicator of how many years experience they have. Someone who comes into a teaching position who's making $36,000, we know that person's coming with a lot of experience from somewhere else. Okay. I just wanted to kind of lay that out to you. So it's seven board representatives, the two at large, our mayor, so there's a total of 10 on the school committee who then give direction to the superintendent who then carries out the desires of the school committee in some instances, not at all as it used to be, okay? The school committee has, and it's in your packet, the one that looks like this, several committees. They are finance, rules and policy, <coughs> personnel, curriculum and instruction, <coughs> special programs, maintenance, operations, and athletics. Everyone is on a committee, probably more committees than what we want to be. And through those subcommittees, um, when a, let's say a class, Magnet Middle School, Peck, Lynch, um, the high school senior class, um, the football team, you want to have a fundraiser, uh, or you, like last year, the seniors decided they wanted to have a pajama jam, a dance after the prom. They had to come to the school committee to ask permission to use the high school. <laughs> so we received the letter at the school committee meeting, and then we sent it to a subcommittee so that it'll give the students an opportunity to come and tell the school, the, the school committee what it is that they want to do. We had concerns about what kind of pajamas were going to be worn, um, and are kids going to come in in bare feet, or, you know, we had questions like that. Um, and was everybody going to come from the prom? And if you didn't go to the prom, <coughs> could you still come to the pajama gym? So it was those kind of things. It turned out to be a wonderful dance. I heard the superintendent dance till 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, and there was tons of Chinese food left over. So um, it's those type of things that happen at the subcommittee meetings not when the full board is meeting. So as students, when you have a request, all you have to do is put it in writing, send it to the school committee, the superintendent will present it to the full board, it will then be sent to a subcommittee, which then you'll be notified to come in and basically request what it is that you're seeking. Um, and then we will give you an answer. Usually we try to do it that same evening tell you yes or no, or we might have some questions and ask you to do some more homework and come back and give us more information, um, and then we'll vote on it. We'll send it to the full committee and we'll ask them to either vote the request down or to vote in favor of it. So if you have a request um, as students of the public schools, if, if that's where you're all coming from, then that's, the, that's where you go. Send your letters, send your requests. Someone is going to pay attention because every letter that the superintendent gets must come to the school committee, okay? And we receive it, please. Can you give a few more examples of requests you see something you're going to Sure. Um, the last week, um, I was at a subcommittee meeting where a group of students want to go to Disneyland. Um, and they belong to a club. And they needed, one was they needed permission to go um, because it was going to be, it's, it's the band. Um, they wanted to go representing the Holyoke Public Schools so that when they go in the uniform of the Holyoke Public Schools, they need our permission. So they wanted, one, to go to Disney with our approval, and two, for us to help them with the cost. Um, so they came to us. So one was, do they get the permission to go? And the other one was, can we, do we have money in the budget to help them to go? 
So they're going to have some fundraisers, and after the fundraisers, we'll see if they're short some money, and then we will decide whether or not we can assist them um, financially. Another one was um, the high school um, student council came in. Oh, I forgot something real important. I'll remember. Um, there you go. <laughs> We have a student council representative here who's going to keep me on my toes today. <laughs> Thank you, Julio. Um, the student council came in front of the school committee and asked if we would, one, approve for them to bring in a motivational speaker, and two, would we pay for it? <laughs> Julio was telling me that he was wonderful. So we sent it to a subcommittee. And we said, yes, you may bring in the motivational speaker. And two, we dug up $650 that they needed to pay. Um, and then it went to the full board. We said, yes, yes, yes. And the motivational speaker was in on Tuesday. The school committee, it was the high school who brought in the request. It was the school committee who said, we'll do it. But he has to do both schools. We want him to do the high school and dean. Because it's not fair just because one school brings it that the other school can't benefit from it. Now, if Dean was to come in and say, we also have a band and we also want to go to Disney, you know, it, those kind of decisions have to be made. Um, if someone wants to have a dance at one of the schools, that has to come to school committee. If someone wants to sell, sell the M&Ms, that has to come to school committee. We need to make sure that um, when the students are selling the candies, one is what company you get in the candy from, are you getting the best buy, and who are you going to hand in your money to? And making sure that that's, that's where it should be going. Do you give it to your teacher? Do you give it to the cafeteria worker? Do you give it to the custodian? Who do you give it to? So we just want to make sure that when you have a fundraiser, um, that your money is going to be protected and that it's there for you for when you want to use it. Um, are those enough examples? <laughs> Going back a little bit, I, I'm curious about the decision to uh, relinquish authority um, to hire and for hiring to the superintendent. Was that a school committee decision or did that come from the state? That was state legislation. That was educational reform. Believe me, there are many okay. school committee members that are not happy. Many school committee members. But I must share with you, on a personal level, that was one duty. I didn't mind relinquishing. Right, yeah. I didn't mind. I think that when you hire this individual, you have to have total faith that this individual is going to hire the most competent people. Um, and that if those individuals don't work out, you hold him her responsible for that. Yes, for example, we had a dark school, school and we had been sitting there for a long period of time. If I want people to realize that all the equipment we have in there cost more than six thousand dollars just in a larger without the tanks and all other equipment that we have, I just sitting there getting dust. If I have the concern that I want the school to start providing this class again because I know they used to but now with the cuts in the budget they don't have it, but they have the equipment getting damaged without being used. I would say that a couple of things that you said. One is um, that brings to mind is the cuts in the budget. The cuts in the budget happened two years ago. Last year we got a big chunk of money and there were a lot of services put back into the schools. This year, um, not even a month ago at a school committee meeting, it was made public that we had $1.3 million sitting there not being used for anything. So of course, all the school committee members started saying, I want this, I want that. For instance, I'll give you what we want. I wanted a school after school. I wanted a school to be developed, a program developed for students that are over age, like for the middle school, so that you could be 17, but that academically you might be still learning like at a fifth, sixth grade level. So that is it really appropriate to have that student be in the middle school when in fact age-wise they belong in the high school. But you can't put them in a high school trying to accrue credits because academically they'll never survive. They'll be 9th, 10th, 11th grade forever. They'll never get out. So what I've wanted to do for eight years, and finally it's come together, is to have a program 
I call it my school after school. It's going to happen in Dean. Um, it is going to start somewhere between 2.30 and 3.30 within the next month, hopefully. And students that are overaged for the middle school but aren't academically prepared to accrue credits at a high school, whether it be Dean um, or the high school itself, that they can go to the school. Their needs will be assessed. They will be assisted on one-on-one -on -one small groups to get them academic academically prepared to go on to the high school. So that when they get into probably the ninth grade is where those students belong, they can start accruing credits and not stay in ninth grade for three years, become 21, feel frustrated and humiliated, and drop out. So that, that was one of my requests, and I refused to let it go. So that $1.3 million goes quickly when there's those kind of programs that are going to be taken from that money. So it wasn't like I wanted to go shopping at the mall. It was, <laughs> I wanted to, I have a program, please. If you wanted to write a letter to the school committee, how long does it take you to answer that? <laughs> if you were to, good question, good question. We had cheerleaders the other day, the, the Holyoke Youth Football Cheerleaders. Cheerleaders. And they were wonderful. But they sent in a request to the Holyoke School Committee in March. And, they, and their request was, can you provide a space to practice when it's raining and cold outside? March. We are in October. October. From March to October. And they were feeling angry. And they had every right to be angry. Why did it take them so long? Well, the explanation was is that because of liability issues, it had to be sent to a lawyer to figure it out. Who had insurance? What kind of insurance does the city have? But if they were on school property, did it mean that the school had to cover it? So it gets fuzzy. I would like to stand here and say to you that if you were to write a letter to the school committee, we meet on the first and the third Monday of every month for a full board meeting. Not to count all the subcommittee meetings that happen in between there, but the first and third Monday. If you were to send a letter anywhere during that month, the month previous, it should hit one of those meetings. It then goes to a subcommittee meeting. My time frame, to be short, I always say to get in and out of the school committee with a yes or no, it takes a month and a half to two months. That's the way I put it. Month and a half to two months. So who I have to write my request? That was the second piece of your of your question. I would say that if I was to be a student at any of the schools, I would first go to the principal. And I would say, this is a concern I have. Now, that individual can support you or not support you or just kind of tell you, go along to your next class. You as a student, um, as a consumer, because I see you as a as you know the, the, the customer of the system, you have the right to then write a letter to the superintendent for the school committee. And you say, I would like now the superintendent might give you a call and say, who else or what's going on? Or you might want to talk to the student council representatives and they're very active, which is the missing piece here on the school committee. There's really 14 of us. I forgot to tell you that there are two student body, uh, student council officers of, of each school, of dean and of the high school, on the school committee. They do not have voting power, but they are there. They voice their concerns. There is a part of the agenda, which is for student reports. Last year, we were called on the carpet by the dean representative saying, we don't have books in such and such a class. And then in this other class, we're using books that are over 20 years old. They said it. We wish he wouldn't have, but he said it. So we had to do something about it. So that your student representatives on the councils um, are key, because then they could also follow up. They're also, I would say, very responsible. For the middle schools, though, I think that if you can't work it out with your principals, then write a letter. Get that letter to the superintendent who in turn will pump it to the school committee. School committee then will be sending you a letter saying through the superintendent telling you come to this subcommittee meeting and we'll discuss it there. Educational reform 
um, what it did was is, is that it took certain powers away from the school committee and from the superintendent as well. Each building now operates almost independently. Each building, by the law, the way the educational reform bill passed, needs to have a school council. And that school council is made up of the principal and as many teachers minus one as there are parents. Explanation. If there are five parents on your council, you can only now have four teachers on the council because the principal makes up the other one. It took us over four weeks to get an answer from the Department of Education um, to figure that out because we thought it was five and five and then the principal. Uh -huh. It's four and the principal and five parents. Council would have 20 parents that you could open it up to the entire teacher population, but it'll always be minus one because the principal fits in that additional person. It will be there that the parents will have the opportunity um, to voice their concerns about what's going on in their particular building. Previous to the educational reform bill and the school councils, there here in Holyoke, there was a citywide parent planning council. And that council came together, actually when I came into office eight years ago. And because of a lot of different reasons, the two and a half, the changes in administration, of course, our, when, for myself, our kids grow up and they finish school and they're gone and it takes time to get um, the parents of the new students involved. There weren't that many parents involved last year. So the, the school council now takes a different focus. You're able to work in the school that your child is involved in, is, is participating in. Problem with that is, is the way our school system is set up. Our children change schools often. No one is in any, in any one school for a long period of time. So no sooner are you getting to be comfortable with the teachers and the administrators and just procedures and programs, your kid is off to another school. We know that we'll try to work with that. Um, but it will be imperative, for, it will be important for parents to be involved in their schools. They will be an advisory committee to the principal on how the budget for that school should look like, on how the rules, each school will have its own rules as it had before. Um, and how just the different programs and what you want to see happen at that building, it is now up to the principal. It now doesn't go to an administrator, to the superintendent, and to the school committee. It happens at the building level. So it can actually make a lot of um, changes. It's an opportunity for change. It's an opportunity to let parents play a major role in what goes on in that building. So how do they select the parents that, that are on the advisory committee? There is, the school committee was, should I say, the, um, well, the system, the entire public school system was given 40 days from a particular day in September, which I don't remember, <coughs> to form those councils. You can't say, in January, I'm still trying to form my council. You had 40 days from a particular day that the Department of Ed chose um, to have your councils in place. Each school building should have had, or should be having in the very near future, their building meeting already. That, and it should have been announced, and there were, there's outreach workers in each building to be assisting the principals in doing that. Principals do not have an option as to whether they want to have a school council or not. They've got to do it. Yeah, well my question was, uh, is there a procedure or, or is it up to each principal? It's up to each principal. It's up to each principal to find the ways and means on how to get parents into the building. Um, so that they could do it through the outreach worker, they could do it through flyers, they could, you know, whatever the means are, they could do it through a annou radio announcement, through newspapers, whatever they feel um, is appropriate, that's how they could do it. Okay. Isn't there a requirement though that parents elect in some way the parent representatives through PTO or yes. something? So there has to be an election yes. by parents of the parent rep. But it doesn't um, exclude any other parent who just wants to be a member 
They'll be your exec, your officers, but then, let's suppose I don't want to be president or vice president or secretary or treasurer, but I still want to come to meetings and be involved in interacting with the other parents and teachers. I have that opportunity. Just because I'm not an officer doesn't mean then that I can't play a role within my child's school. Clear? Yeah, I was going to ask you. La pregunta era en español. Está bien, te entiendo. ¿Qué sucede cuando un programa este, es ya hecho este, para enseñar a, la, a los jóvenes, corre, este, se le acaba el presupuesto? Este, este programa cubre, como decía Julio ahorita, o sea que, yo digo por ejemplo, el este, proceso de velo, ¿no? el coche ya está acabado. So, ¿Qué hacen ellos? Este? Para este año. Ajá. Buena pregunta. La pregunta es: ¿qué happens? when there is a program in place, the budget is in place already for this year, how will the parents or how will the school council be able to then make up their program for this year when in fact it's already developed? For this year, you're right, there's very little that can be done. But really, this is the time, the next month and December is the beginning of the process of putting together next year's budget for 94, 95, so that it has to happen now for next year. Now for a parent who has a student that that's going to be their last year in that school, those, those are the pieces that I don't think that the individuals that wrote the law, that wrote the bill, really took it all into consideration. The other thing that I want to say is, is that this um, law was passed for July, to be effective July 1st. And but before July 5th, there were 151 amendments to the bill. <laughs> so that it's constantly changing. Every time we want to do something, you got a call, and it goes through rigmarole, two, three weeks, and then you kind of get an answer. And don't be surprised if you get another answer a week later. It's going to take time to kind of get it all straightened out. But it's a good question, and it's an issue for the parents whose kids are, you know, let's say a senior. At the high school, like, why am I going to be involved this year when, in fact, the change isn't going to happen until next year? So, as a senior, for me, it will be important because I'm going to be helping my older peers. If I, if I get a strong foundation, they're going to be able to succeed in their first year to the year that they have left. That might be. I can see why you were elected at the high school. <laughs> Not just that, if you're a senior, you're done. Okay, you're going out of there, but you're going to be done. And you're going to be able, you have the knowledge that your students need to succeed in their senior career. So you better build a strong foundation as a senior or higher than for this thing coming. Okay. I, I had a question on the, the rules, books, and manuals that the student received. Student policy? Yes, yeah, student policy is in constant change. So with this bill, who's going to be making that book, book policy? The rules and policy will still be made up of the, by the school committee. And that manual that you're talking about has been changed. I've been on the rules and policy subcommittee for eight years. And it's in constant change because there are laws that are passed that then force us to change the manual. So it's constantly being changed. You're right. You're right. And it must be confusing. Yeah, it is a little bit confusing, but the school committee is the one who make that. We still do the rules of policy. And we have an attorney um, that's always on retainer to keep us in line and in check with what it is that we're supposed to be doing. I've got to do a time check here. It is 4 o'clock. I have still yet some more material to cover. Who needs to leave? And can we make some agreements if people need to leave right now? I envision that I need to go straight with almost no questions for at least 15 minutes. No more than 15 minutes. Can we stay? Do we need to leave? Anybody need to leave? No? Okay. Thank you for coming to me. No? Can we stay 15 minutes? And then if you have questions, you could raise them? Okay? Okay, sorry for the change in the middle of the program. The other elected, I don't, let me just say this. I see that there's a real big interest on school committee and procedures. I will be more than happy to talk about that 
again next time, and if you still feel that there's a need to cover some more um, gaps in the information that I'm giving you, we can put it on at the fourth session. Okay? So I don't want you to think that I'm kind of skipping over it and we can't go back. The other elected officials besides the mayor, the city council, the school committee, there's only two others, and it's the city clerk and the treasurer. And they get elected every four years. Okay? Right now we have uh, Susan Egan. She was appointed which means she didn't run for an election. The city council appointed her because, what was his name? James. How terrible. I forgot the former city clerk's um, name. That's horrible. Wonderful man. He was my historian. Uh, always gave me all the history I needed on the city of Polio. Mr. James Shea, excuse me. It was come. Um, I apologize for forgetting his name. He retired. Um, in the middle of his um, term so that someone had to be appointed to take over his duties and Susan Egan was appointed and now she's up for election and she's running I believe unopposed so it shouldn't be um, a problem for her and the treasurer okay those are the only other two elected individuals in the city the process that I'm going to talk about is somewhat confusing and it's always in changing and I would say that when I was trying to gather the information for this workshop at City Hall I wasn't able to get all of the accurate information that I needed and I don't think that people didn't want to give me the information it's that there's still, um, for some positions, certain things happen, and for other positions, other things happen, and I wasn't able to get all of that information for you for today. But I promise that before the series of workshops are over, I will try to put all of that information um, together for you. I did not realize when I approached City Hall, the city clerk's office, as a matter of fact, is where I got all this information, that it actually was going to take more time um, than what I thought I would have to name each position in City Hall um, and there's like I said a different procedure so what my intent is is to gather that information for you and give it to you in a handout and we could reflect on it for a couple of minutes um, at, a, at another um, presentation. For each department um, in City Hall the mayor appoints um, he, excuse me, he recommends um, a name to the city council, and the city council then um, votes on it so that it is in the individual and in the mayor's best interest to make sure that they get to as many city councilors prior to the evening that they're going to vote on it. I asked the city clerk yesterday, is there a hiring process? for each individual, each department head. And she told me no. She said that it doesn't have to be, you don't have to advertise. The city doesn't have to advertise. It doesn't have to say, um, I'll take the purchasing director. Um, there was a vacancy there. You know, the position was available. They don't have to, they don't have to advertise. They don't have to take resumes. It's just the mayor. The mayor could recommend someone. And when he recommends someone, it goes to city council, and then city council decides whether that individual gets it or not. They cannot that night say, oh, we don't want who the mayor recommended, let's hire Ben. They can't do that. But they could give a negative vote for the recommendation. The city clerk yesterday informed me that the city council is trying to file, is trying to pass an ordinance to the complete opposite, that it goes through a hiring process, that there has to be a job description developed, that there has to be an, um, there has to be outreach, advertisement, publicity done around it, um, and that there has to be an interviewing process and a system for the interviews as to who is who actually comes out ahead on the interviews, and then that recommendation is the one that goes to the city council. But that's not the case today. So, 
I just use these uh, for instance. You've got all of the departments in your handout. So the personnel department, purchasing director, so forth, park and rent, um, and others, they get um, recommended by the mayor, and then it goes over to city council. Now the messenger for the city um, is appointed by the city council. Okay? Not by the mayor. It just goes into the city council. And that position gets reappointed on an annual basis. It's just a reappointment. Just keeps on reappointing that individual until that individual decides to leave, just like the others. So there's, it's almost like a marriage, if we can call it that. Um, then, again, in your handout, there's the different commissions and the different boards. It also is, it goes to the city council with the mayor's recommendation. And for the most part, these are paid positions, or should I say, not all of them are paid. You have here where it says office of city clerk in the handout. Um, we've given you who's paid and who isn't paid, and like I said earlier, one commission that I noticed is on, not on here is the park and rec department, but it is in this handout. But it doesn't tell you whether they're paid or not. And it's not listed here at all. Now for the water commission, and for all other commissions, one seat is up every year. Every year, someone on the commission has to leave, or they can get reappointed. <coughs> And each seat, especially for the Water Commission, is for three years. Now, for the sake of this series, I would ask you to look at this handout and look at the Latino surnames that there are here. And out of all of these pages, I was able to find two, and there's, who said two? <laughs> Someone said two, and they um, did not have an update on one. So I think that in total, there are three Latinos to all of the commissions that the city has. And there is a seat open every year on each of the commissions. So just take that to heart. Um, for the school committee, um, for the school committee, different from the city charter, we have our own bylaws, and I have included that in your package. Um, this came fresh off the press. Um, the superintendent wanted to make sure that everything was right and correct and up to date, so what you have is appropriate. Um, and I would say that maybe we could have the end of this discussion regarding school committee and procedures at our next meeting given that we're going to talk about um, Latinos running for public office, what happens, and um, if you have questions between now and then, we could answer them then. I would say that with all of that, this is the conclusion of our first series. I would like to know if anyone has questions or if they identify, um, identify some gaps um, in the presentation that I've made, if you please let me know. I could try to answer it now or I could get you the information for our next workshop. I have a question. What the messenger, the city messenger does? That's like a marketing person. <laughs> <laughs> the, I'm the curious. I know the city yeah. messenger has. No, no. He is, a lot of it is like a messenger. They do a lot of running around for the city. They take, um, a lot of times you need to get one piece of paper over just to someone very quickly. There are emergencies. They do um, a lot of the postings. I mean, I don't want to um, try to define his position, this position today. Similar to the committees for the city council, I think I know what goes to what committee, but it's hard for me to say, you know, just off the cuff, this is what they're supposed to be doing. So that, I mean, but again, what the city council is trying to do is trying to go through a hiring process where you get the, the best qualified person for that position, as opposed to just taking names and making the recommendation and then hiring them for a very long time. I'm not even sure, as I stand before you today, what the evaluation process is within the city hall. Who evaluates how commissioners um, and board of directors of different departments um, 
How do they function? How do they operate? Is there something that says if you don't come to three or four meetings, you're not on anymore? I can't answer that for you. Um, I didn't get a practice, but I did glance at one, and I saw Gloria Arsett on as the on the arts conference, and I know she was appointed way before Hamilton. Has Mayor Hamilton appointed either of the other two black people that are on the list? Um, Mayor Hamilton appointed Harry Ortiz to the Licensing Commission, and he also recently appointed um, Senor Juan Pedraza to the Holyoke Housing Authority. So those are two. Carlos, did I forget any? Those are the only two recently. And Elba. So there's four. Excuse me. There's Elba Ruelas, who's on the voter registration um, commission as well. So there's, I think, four. I, I could feel pretty comfortable in saying that there are ten yeah. <laughs> of all of the commissioners in the, in the city. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Which one of all these meetings are open to the public and which ones are closed? Everything that I presented to you today is open. Everything has to be open. And there are um, laws that govern those open meetings. In order for anyone that is in your packet today wants to have a closed session, an executive session, they could only do it for certain reasons and at certain times. Other than that, a complaint can be filed with the district attorney or with the secretary of state who will do a thorough investigation and a finding will um, come out of that. I mean, I must say that there are several commissions and including a school committee who has been put on warning about executive sessions and the reasons why we go into executive session and even the procedure on how to go into executive session. So you just can't go into executive session because we're going to talk about something delicate. That doesn't cut it. You have to be very clear as to why. Um, and at times, decisions have been made behind closed doors. I need to find out that that's not the appropriate place to make that kind of a decision. Answer? Yes. The next meeting is on October 27th, which is next Wednesday, from 3 to 4 o'clock. From the youth, can I get feedback? Did this work for you? Did you understand it? Yep. Understood it? Yeah? yeah? Yep. So you're our future school committee members and our city council yes. and hopefully mayor. <laughs> I want to thank everyone for coming and taking the time.